many advantages to having a six foot wife. One of them being the picking of elderflowers. Well, that's not a bad hole. I think we should make some elderflower wine. Okay, I've got the elderflower home. It's just soaking in cold water overnight. I noticed there were some bits of black fly and that in there. So I'm just going to do that and hopefully kill those off. So we'll pick this recipe up in the morning. See you then. Hey folks, it's the next morning. It's 4.15am. It's extremely warm and I can't sleep. So I'm just going to crack on. Right, so this is the elderflower as it is in the water at the minute. In terms of bugs floating to the top, I can't really see any. To be honest, I was expecting to see bits of flies on top, uh, but I can't see any. I'm gonna pour this through this colander down here to drain it off. Yeah, we can lose the green as well. <laughs> so while the elderflower's draining in the sink, Let's get some rhubarb. Yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful morning. Look at the moon. So it's nice and cool outside, but inside it is so stuffy. So there's the rhubarb. The gooseberries will be ready soon. is today's haul. Right, I'm back in the kitchen. Let's go through the full list of ingredients for today's brew. Okay, so it's elderflower and rhubarb. So there's my elderflower draining in the sink. Here's the rhubarb that I've just picked. I'm going to chop that down. I'm also going to be using about four litres of spring water, one kilogram of brewing sugar, one lemon. My yeast of choice today is Lalvin EC1118 Champagne Sparkling Wine and Cider Yeast. I'm going to be feeding that with some Young's Yeast Nutrient. I'm going to be adding some pectolase to hopefully break down any pectic enzymes so it will be a clearer brew. And I'm going to add four Earl Grey tea bags to impart a few tannins. This is a flavour wine that I've never made before, but I really like the fact that these are all natural ingredients growing in the garden and they're seasonal. Right, let's crack on. First of all, I'm going to put all my elderflowers into this wok. There's a ton of elderflower there. Now, so going on my dad's ratio, which is what I would normally use for this, I would normally go like this to get the flowers off the stalks and fill a pint pot. One full pint pot is enough for one gallon. So in metric terms, 568 mil of flower heads is enough for four and a half litres of elderflower wine. Now I'm doing it a slightly different way this time. This is the lazy way. I'm leaving them on the stalks, but I think it'll be okay. And I've never tried it before. So let's just see what happens. So there's my elderflower in the wok. So I'll put the wok on the ring. Into the wok, I'm gonna add the four Earl Grey tea bags. In they go. And then I'm going to add two liters of spring water, just still spring water. And I'm using spring water because the tap water in Leeds is chlorine. So what I'm essentially gonna make is some elderflower tea. So the lid goes on the wok. Okay, I'm gonna turn that right down. And I want that to come to a very gentle simmer and I'm quite happy for that to take an hour or so to get to that point. So while I'm waiting for the elderflower tea to come to a simmer and brew, let's sort this rhubarb out. So I need to top and tail my rhubarb. I take the leaf off the top and I take the rooty bit off the bottom, so that's the first job for me. And all the bits that I chop off will go back to being compost for the garden. So that's all of my rhubarb stalks topped and tailed. I'm just gonna give each one a little shower, make sure there's no bits of soil on them. Once showered, I'm gonna chop these down into small pieces, like so. So that's all the rhubarb pieces chopped up and put into this saucepan. I'm going to add one litre of water on top of them. That will do. Lid goes on the pan. And that needs to come to a gentle simmer 
also. So I've got my elderflower, I've got my rhubarb, and now I've got a third pan on the ring, and this pan has just got tap water and a muslin cloth in it, and I'm going to boil that cloth to sterilise it. So this is just a patient waiting game, I might as well have a cuppa. Well it's a 5am cup of tea in the garden. You've got to love a Yorkshire summer. Come back to you in a bit. So 30 minutes later and we've got some simmering. The whole kitchen smells of elderflower. That rhubarb has probably broken down nicely. Just take the lid off. So rhubarb, when you apply heat to it, it does break down very easily. Yeah, that's gone nice and mushy. So that's good. I'm going to turn the heat completely off that now. And I'm going to leave this to steep all day long so that it infuses properly. As for the elderflower, let's have a look at that. I'm just going to push this down into the water. You can see the colour of that, so this has released a ton of oil. Now, I'm going to pop the lid back on and I'm going to leave that to simmer for another 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes is up. I'm going to turn the heat off and I'm going to leave both of these now on the hob for the next few hours. Catch you later. Hey folks, I'm back. It's actually about 14 hours later. Yeah, we're now in the evening and I've decided I'm going to make this a two day recipe. I've had a massive amount on today and I'm not going to get it all done in one day. So what's the point in rushing? There's none at all. Let's have a look at those elderflowers. And these have been steeping lovely all day long. And the amount of flavour in these is incredible. And I can tell you that from the smell, which is just absolutely wonderful. I would wear that as aftershave, seriously I would. Although I might attract every cat in the neighbourhood because it does have that cat pee smell. But it's nice, it's a nice cat pee smell. Elderflower has a good smell. So what I want to do now is to transfer all of this stuff into this colander and it might come out in a big lump and it might not and it is doing lots of drips right one two three straight in let's not mess about no fear and the tea bags oh let's get it all in and now let's have the big dramatic pour Which really wasn't that dramatic. Good. Who needs drama? So with the back of a ladle, I want to give these a squeeze. And I want all the liquid to come out of them. And when I feel like they've drained enough, then we'll move on to the rhubarb. I'll come back to you in an hour or so, and then we'll sort the rhubarb out. A couple of hours later, and I think we can all agree that that's pretty dried out. There's a little drip there, but there's nothing much going on underneath it. So let's get this discarded onto the garden as compost. That's ready to go on the garden now. The rhubarb next needs straining. Now, I was going to put the rhubarb through a blender to make a smoothie and then run it through a muslin cloth on top of this. However, I don't think I need to do that because if I look at the rhubarb, it's really well broken up, macerated, etc. So I think I can just pour this on there. The liquid will come out and the solid that's left will make some nice jam. And all I'm going to do with this now is leave it overnight. What a very annoying pan that was. Anyway, all I'm gonna do is leave this overnight to drain. I want all the liquid to come out of it and tomorrow we'll pick this up and put this brew together properly. So I'll catch you tomorrow morning and we'll pick it up then. See you later, folks. Hey folks, it's the next day, which means it's preparation day two stroke brew day one. Let's have a look at what we've got. And this is the rhubarb that has drained. I am going to separate this and use this to make some jam, but what is left underneath is a really pungent smelling elderflowery rhubarb 
thick liquid. So I'm just going to remove that from there. Nothing gets wasted. I want to put the lid on and I want to bring this now to a pre-simmer, somewhere between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius. I want it to sort of kill off any potential bacteria that might have got in there. I don't think there will be any, but I'm being hyper-cautious. And then I'm going to leave it to cool naturally throughout the day before putting it in the demijohn tonight. So gas on, heat on, and I want it on a low heat. I don't want it nuking. So when this is heated up, I'll come back to you. Okay, I've just turned the heat off as it was getting to a pre-boil. So we'll have a quick look. Nice and steamy, so that's definitely pasteurised any baddies that were in there. I'm now going to add to that one kilo of brewing sugar, dextrose monohydrate, which will increase the physical volume as well as the original gravity. I'm going to give that a stir around. It will dissolve pretty much instantaneously. In fact, it has done. Nothing there. That has just gone. I've moved the pan onto a back cold ring and I'm going to put this on top so that the steam can escape but no nasties can get into it. I don't mind if the steam escapes, that's just water vapour and it will simply concentrate what's in there. While this is cooling down I've got a couple of ingredients to add into it. Firstly some pectolase. So this should hopefully break down any haziness caused by me boiling the fruit matter. It may or may not. I'll put uh, one and a half dessert spoonfuls of that in there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I've now got my lemon and I'm just going to give that a little rinse under the tap. It's not a waxed one but I'm just going to rinse it in case there's anything on there which I don't want to take the brew. Then I'm going to cut my lemon in half and I'm going to juice it on here. I'm going to get all the juice out of it. That's pretty good. And the other half, just the same. Lovely stuff. So just taking the top off there and the lemon juice also goes into the pan. Then I'm just going to grate a little bit of zest off the skin. Can't beat a bit of zest. So that was limited success. I didn't really get any zest in there, but there is some stuck to the grater. So what I'm going to do is just dunk the grater in there. This is hot enough to be pasteurised, so I'm quite comfortable that I'm not damaging it in any way by doing that. And now you can see some little bits of zest floating on top. A dose of lemon with elderflower or rhubarb always goes down a treat. Hey folks, several hours have passed. Let's have a look at what I've got. And what I have here is one very ugly looking, but one very aromatic panful of warm liquid. Now it's warm, it's not hot, I can touch it quite easily. So this is safe to pour into my fermenting vessel, which today is a 1970s Demijohn from Boots the Chemist, the War Horse. So before I pour my wine must in, I'm just gonna pour a bit of cold water in first just to protect the bottom of the demijohn. Not that I think it needs it, but I'm just being safe. So there's about a litre of water gone in there. Now for the big pour, let's hope no dramas. And that's going in just lovely. Super. So my demijohn is nearly full, but not quite. I'm going to put a bit more water in there just to raise the physical volume. Um, I know I'm overfilling it, but I don't care if it blows through because I can just wash it out. It's fine. It's not a problem. Okay, and in that goes. Right, now I have overfilled the demijohn and I don't mind. So here is one overfilled demijohn. Here is a long handled teaspoon. Teaspoon upside down. Give it a stir. And I need all this to mix together so I get a consistent reading for the original gravity. Because it's got water, must and water. And I don't want it to separate into the constituent layers. Okay, I'm confident that that should be fine. So I'm going to sacrifice 100ml for the original gravity reading. That won't go back into it, so the physical volume of this will decrease. <laughs> Okay, 100ml out, and that leaves a little bit more space in the top of the demijohn. 
So this is my hydrometer flask. It needs to go in the fridge for a, a good 20 to 30 minutes to cool this down to 20 degrees before I can take the original gravity. So off I trot with this for a second. I'll be back. I'm back and that means that my attention is now back on the demijohn because we now need to add the rest of the dry ingredients into there. Using a dry funnel and a clean different teaspoon I'm now going to put the yeast nutrient into this. I'm going to give it two heaps teaspoonfuls. Not massively heaped, let's say rounded. There's one and there's two. So another teaspoon's now needed. I can't dip this in my yeast as it's got nutrient on it and that will activate the yeast. Teaspoon number three. So my yeast of choice is Lalvin EC1118 Champagne Sparkling Wine and Cider Yeast, which is pretty cracking stuff. It's Bobby Dazzling. It always does a good job for me. And I'm just going to use one rounded teaspoonful. And I've poured that in and I'm just leaving it on top. I'm not doing anything with it. Sometimes I stir it in, sometimes I shake it around, sometimes I just leave it on top. I've got no idea what's the right way, to be quite honest, but it always works. Anyway, I do it. I'm just doing it au naturel today. If anybody would like to tell me in the comments which is the most correct way of doing that, I would be very happy to read what you've got to say and also tell me why, please. I need to know. Or I could ask ChatGPT, but I won't do that. You can tell me. Right, I've got some water in the airlock, so that's good. And I'm going to pop the airlock into the demijohn. Right. And if we just look down onto this, you can see that the yeast has actually fallen in anyway. So I'm just getting some warm water to give this a rinse because there's probably a bit of spillage. Oh, it's a busy kitchen on a very hot day. Anyway, I've got this in the demijohn. I need to wait to take the original gravity, so I'll come back to you then. Right, it's been a good 40 minutes. This is now at room temperature. I'm happy that it's right for the gravity reading. So in goes the hydrometer. I'm wanting a reading somewhere in between 1.080 and 1.090 or thereabouts. And I am on 1.082, so great. So I'm probably gonna be looking at about 11.7%-ish if it goes the full way. So I'm happy with that. So the demijohn's cleaned and I've labelled it and even within 40 minutes of it going in there fermentation is already starting to happen. There's the beginnings of a Krausen. We've got positive pressure in the airlock so CO2 is already being made. This is going to be a fast fermenter. It might be a slightly slow start once it gets going but then when it does get going it will be woof. I'll come back to you with a fermentation update tonight, tomorrow, whenever. See you in a bit. So brew day two and everything is going just lovely. Fermentation strong and steady, Krauss and healthy sized, no blowout. Okay folks, it's brew day four. I've moved the elderflower and rhubarb wine into the living room. And as you can see, fermentation is pretty fast. I will come back to you with an update when fermentation is over. See you then. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It's brew day 16 of my elderflower and rhubarb wine. Let's have a look. So here it is. Fermentation is done. This fermented for no more than 10 days. It's just been sat like this since. And it's now time to get it out of there and into this demijohn. And I'm gonna add some finings. So by adding finings, I am risking it not developing a sparkle because the finings could drag all the yeast which is in there down to the bottom. But I don't want it to get any off flavours. It's been very warm and leaving it sat on the sediment could lead to that. So I want to get it out of there and into the other demijohn and then get these bad boys added. 
So I've just removed the bung and it smells very elderflowery, which is a good sign. Right, no refined siphoning today. I'm just pouring, sod it. If all goes well and this does clear, I'll be bottling it within a week. The reason I'm pouring it like this incidentally is I can see that the type of sediment that is at the bottom is largely clung to the bottom of the demijohn, so I'm not really risking pouring too much of it in. Don't matter if a bit goes in. So I'm now halfway down and I'm going to add finings A. Finings A of Clear It Wine Finings from Young's. So this is the end of a bottle, that's it, done. That's all going in there, that's all my findings gone. This was going out of date, I wanted to get it used up, which is another reason why I'm doing this. Now I go back to my original demi and pour the rest of it in. And yeah, I'm going to get a bit of murk in there, it don't matter. The worst of the sediment is stuck to the bottom and I can see some in the neck of the demi on which I'm not going to allow through. But I don't mind if a bit goes in. Right, I'm going to call it a day at that. So this is getting left behind. It's going to go down the sink. I could reuse it. I don't want to. So now I replace the funnel with the airlock and it's time to play the waiting game. Now I've got findings A in there. I've got to wait one hour and then I had findings B in exactly the same way, but pouring this back from there into the original demijohn, which will be cleaned out. I will catch you in an hour's time for the remainder of this process. See you then. Hey folks, it's been an hour, had a shave, had a shower, feeling fresh. Let's have a look at this. Okay, so looking at the colour of that and the sort of quality of the opacity or opaqueness, I think that this might actually work. Now you never know with findings whether it will work or not, but I do find that Clear It Wine findings from Young's are quite good and I do have a good success rate with them. So now I'm pouring back into the original Demijohn. And this time it's all going in, any sedimenty bits as well. And once again, when I get halfway down, I'm going to add the findings, in this case, findings B. So here we go, findings B. And in they go. Yeah, everything that I've used with the Clear It Wine findings so far this year has been successful in clearing. And a bonus on top of that is that I've had a decent success rate of it still being sparkling too. Now, you just never know whether it will be, but we can live in hope. Okie dokie. Right, funnel out, airlock in, shower tap on. Let's just give the damage on a little rinse. Look at the sticky stuff everywhere. You'll see a bit of activity in the airlock. That's just because I've disturbed it. It's not fermentation. Turn it that way for you. That'll soon stop. So that is this one done for now. We'll come back and have a look at it either later tonight or tomorrow and see if that findings is having any impact. So I'll catch you then. Hey folks, it's the next morning and I think we can all agree that Clear It wine findings from Young's are pretty flipping good. Look at that. Clear as a whistle. So I'll catch up with you in about three or four days time when it comes to bottling. See you then. Good afternoon from the kitchen folks. It's my elderflower and rhubarb wine bottling day. Record breaking bottling day I think on brew day 19. Let's have a look at it. And you can see there it is on the windowsill where I've just put it for this process that it is resplendent and beautifully clear. You can see the garden through it. That's the chimney in the middle. So yeah, that is pretty good. So today I'm going to get it out of the demijohn and into the bottles. So looking at the quantity that's in the demijohn, the headspace there, the sediment line there, I'm not going to get more than five bottles that I'm going to keep and then I'm going to get some for the hydrometer tube and I might have a little bit left over which will go in there as a sampler but that's what's going to be put away for conditioning. And in order for this to condition then it needs some priming sugar. So this is priming sugar so that's just about a teaspoonful of sugar going into that bottle and what will happen is that if there's any yeast left in suspension in there and I must add that there might not be because I find it 
or I've cleared it with finings. But if there is any yeast left in suspension in there and it finds this sugar, it will smash it apart, causing a very fractional fermentation, which will create CO2, which will build up pressure, which creates a sparkle. That's the plan anyway. So I need to get the bung out of the demijohn. The siphoning tube goes in and I'm trying to keep it above the sediment line. I've got it held in place with this clip and now I can just manipulate it downwards a bit. And that's as close as the sediment as I want it to go. I will pick some up with the first bit that comes in there, but that will be going into the hydrometer tube. Right, quick suck. And that's going into the hydrometer tube nicely and now into the first bottle. Okay, I'll just move the hydrometer to one side for a sec. We'll come back and have a look at that shortly. But yeah, this is looking decent. It smells all right too. I need to bottle number two. Yeah, I sometimes try and achieve six bottles per damage on, but when you've got a bit of sediment and a bit of headspace, that's not going to be possible. I'm still happy enough with five. It's got that really distinct elderflower smell. So it's coming down quickly, but I should get that fifth bottle filled. Yeah, that's going to do it. And a bit in the glass. There's my sampler. There we go, nearly half a pint of wine. That's not bad going. So that's not bad looking, is it? Anyway, I'm going to put this to one side and come back to that shortly. I want to get on with the bottling. So I'm just going to put this here. So I've got my plastic recyclable bungs in very hot water. You can see the steam coming off. That just softens them. It makes them a little bit easier to push into the bottles. Uh, it also gives them a last sanitize, which is handy. Hot though. So into the bottle. Now, luckily today, I've sprayed my wrist, so I've got a wrist support on, which is going to save my skin. And then I just push downwards and in it goes. OK, so that one's all the way in. Now, in order for the bung to stay in place, I need to add a cage. So I'm going to pull the cage down over the top tightly and then twist it and twist it and twist it until that cage is secure. These cages are a combination of donated ones and bought ones and they last three or four times each. Okay that is one bottle completely bunged and caged. I've got four more to do, you don't need to see that, I'll come back to you when they're all bunged and caged. Okay there's five bottles in the sink, now I'm getting a quick shower, just washing off the sticky stuff on the outside. Okay I've got the bottles drying, before I can make the labels for them though, we need to work out the alcohol by volume, so let's go back to the hydrometer tube. Right, let's do the dip test. And that is low. Oh yeah, that's good. And that has settled on a final gravity of 0 0.990. I'm happy with that. So because I'm very uncouth, let's have a little nifter out of here rather than the glass I've put to one side. I'll, I'll let the missus have that later. Powerful, powerful flavour of elderflower, but the rhubarb is also there. It gives it quite a nice sort of sweet edge, not, not sweet, sweet edge, but there's something that got, that's got body in the rhubarb that the elderflower doesn't have, and that comes through afterwards. I'm going to be really interested to see how this wine progresses. Anyway, let's get back to those labels. So before I can actually print the labels, I need to work out the final ABV from the gravity readings. So it began on 1.082. I did up from that what it ended on, which was 0 0.990. That equals 0.092, and I multiply this by 131.25, which equals, drumroll please, 12.075%. Let's just say 
12% and I'm very, very happy with that. ka -ching. So I've got a Bluetooth Fomimo printer and if you can see what model it is there if you're interested but it connects to my iPhone nicely. It comes with an app. Created the label there and I'm going to print this out now. Five copies. Here we go. Isn't it swanky? Booyakasha! So I'm just going to get my labels on my bottles before putting them away for the next step in the process, which is conditioning. I'll come back to you in a sec when these are labelled up. And there they are, like five green bottles standing on a worktop. So welcome to the conservatory folks. This is where my wine is going to condition. I'll show you where it is. It's hidden down here, under the table, out of direct sunlight, and it will remain in here now for the next two to three months. So it's currently July. At this time of year, the conservatory stays lovely and warm. In fact, I can look up there at the thermometer and see that it is 23 degrees in here right now, which is perfect for conditioning. The conditioning process will allow the flavours to develop but it will also give it a sparkle. If there is any yeast left in there and it does find that priming sugar, it will cause a fractional fermentation, CO2 will build up and I will get a sparkling wine. And if there's no yeast left in there, then I won't get a sparkling wine. Now, I'm going to give this a good two to three months to condition because I think it's going to need it. So I'm going to come back to you and open this at some point in autumn. So I'll catch you then. See you later, folks. from the kitchen folks. It's the grand opening night for my elderflower and rhubarb wine and I'm very excited about this one as I always am. First things first this is brew day 73 and I want you to have a look at that bung because that has raised and that tells me that despite clearing it and despite the high ABV at 12 percent this is going to have a sparkle. I know it is. I'm going to get a pop I'm always excited about that. Having had a couple of recent fails, this is going to be one I know is going to sparkle. I just hope it tastes nice. So I'm using the dessert fork to unravel the cage because it's got a bit old and twisted over itself. Um, and a bit sharp, to be quite honest, although it's not broken, so it'll be getting used again. What's this off? Chianti, Massio. Yeah, good ones. Right, am I going to get a pop? Yes! <laughs> and look at that vapour. Fantastic. Smells good. Right, let's have a look. I've got the faithful uh, Caskmark Bruegel glass. See what it looks like. <laughs> I'm really happy with that. That is brilliant. Right, right, let's get the picture for the front of the video. So the smell straight away, the real pungent odour of elderflower is massively obvious. Highly floral, high, highly pungent. The rhubarb's not really coming through in the smell. But uh, hopefully I might get a bit in the taste. Let's see. That is really delicious. It's not obvious it's rhubarb, but there's definitely something there with the elderflower. It's toning the elderflower down, believe it or not. Now I'm talking now and giving it some lip smacking. I'm getting it on the back burner. That's interesting. It's really, really flavoursome, very fruity. It's dry, but not too dry. It's more of a medium dry and at 12% I think that is a bit of a result to be honest because I expected it to be like drier than sand but it's not at all. It's got quite an amount of body to it. Good mouthfeel. Delicious flavour and it looks pretty a-okay to me. All in all this has been a fantastic success and I'm really really happy with it. So anyway, 
Thanks for watching the film folks, thanks for all your support, thanks for your comments. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, and I will catch you on the next film, whatever that may be. Cheers. The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the Home and Garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. -S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.